Hello and welcome to Give Yourself Some Leeway with me, your host, Eugene Lee. Today I am joined by Deborah Cherns, certified yoga therapist and author of From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. Deborah comes from a lifelong career in marketing and communications, oftentimes with products that were incongruent with her values and beliefs. And she's finally transitioned into a yoga therapist where now she can serve her clients to her full potential. Today, we discuss holistic and alternative practices to optimize your physical and emotional well-being. And oftentimes, these are very easy, enjoyable, and mostly free. All it takes is a moment of your time. So as always, you can join the conversation over at giveyourselfsomeleeway.com on social media, at eugene.leeway on Instagram, or shoot me an email, eugene at leeway.ie. Thank you, and I really hope you enjoy today's episode with Deborah Charns. Deborah, welcome to Give Yourself Some Leeway, and thank you for taking the time to join the show. It's a pleasure of mine to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Deborah, would you like to share a bit about your story and your personal journey? who it is that you want to serve and what's the driving passion behind that? Why do you do what you do? I could go on forever about that. (laughs) But um, I would say from the time I was very young, my mother was a writer. And so from the time I was very young, I liked to write, but I was also an explorer. And I traveled from the time I was very, from the time I was 16, I traveled out of my country, which is the United States, on my own to explore. And I loved exploring. I loved learning new things. And then in the end, (laughs) I ended up working in the writing industry, but as marketing communications. And if you know anything about marketing, or for those who do, it is so common that we are marketing products and services that we don't believe in. It's all about selling stuff, usually. And I was doing that for a long time. I was selling beer, and I was selling burgers, and I have not I pretty much have not been drinking any alcohol since I was 21 years old. Once I became legal age, I pretty much stopped drinking. (laughs) And I haven't had a burger since I was 16 years old. (laughs) So just as an example, you know, you you do what you got to do to to fill your bank account. And it's not like I had this huge bank account, but that's what I did. And of course it felt empty. Not only did it feel empty, it felt like I was selling myself out and it hurt, but I kept doing it because, Hey, that, that was what I needed to do. And I will say, I've always loved my jobs. I did amazing campaigns. I worked for wonderful, um, companies and 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 other executives i learned so much and i would always justify what i was doing because traditionally i was doing community relations or public awareness campaigns so uh let's just say i did a lot that was in the education field encouraging younger people to get their college degrees Of course, that is very admirable. So you might ask, what didn't I like about it? Well, what I didn't like about it was that all of these educational campaigns that I was doing were funded by a beer company and beer companies are not officially supposed to market people that are under the age of 21. (laughs) So that's where, you know, again, I was a little bit of a, you know, torn in different directions. At the same time, I was always interested in holistic lifestyle. I grew up in a diabetic household. I was always very aware of healthy, nutritional eating options. And gradually, I just kind of moved more and more in that direction. 
So it sounds like for a long time you were very working incongruently with your values and your beliefs. Exactly. Both with beer and, was... and with burgers. And I, I think for a lot of people, when they're in that industry, when you're when when you're in an industry like alcohol or fast food or something, you're often much less likely when once you work behind the scenes, you're much less likely to actually interact with them and be like, do I really want that in my body? Well, I always knew I didn't want that in my body, but I will also say to add on not just burger and beer, but other clients that I worked for were pharmaceuticals. And I currently am 65 years old and I take zero pharmaceuticals. Again, I am right now, I am a holistic health coach. I try to do everything without pharmaceuticals. And of course, I was pushing pharmaceuticals. Something else just that reflects who I am and what I was doing that was not in sync with my values is something that may seem as innocuous as diapers, nappies. Do you call them nappies? Yeah. Na yeah. Nappies in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, when my daughter was little, I hand washed all of her cloth diapers myself by hand, <laughs> hung them out to dry in the sun. They were big, huge squares. I had to fold them. I mean, I'm talking, you know, very, I don't want to say old school, but how, how I believe it should be done as, and to not have the waste. And so even something that, again, I'm not saying people should not use diapers, but I chose to go the cloth route because I felt it was better for the environment and better to have cloth on the skin rather than plastic. And so that's just another example of the many, many products and services that I represented that I did not believe in. And what was the turning point or that moment of realization where it was no more, am I going to work incongruent with my values and beliefs? What was that turning point for you that you were going to follow your own path? It was very unusual, I think, is that it really was a light switch just turned off from one day to the another that said, I'm not going to do it. I had already, um, during one of my vacation periods, I went to Mexico and I did my yoga teacher your training intensive in Mexico. So I had already gotten my certification to teach yoga, but I could never teach because I was working 80 hour work weeks, seven days a week. And I was traveling all over the United States and Latin America. So I could never teach even though I wanted to, but I was volunteering to teach at a spiritual center in the United States whenever I was available on the weekend. And there were two weeks in a row when I went and there was a lecture each week given by a different person. And the theme was a different theme each week. However, what I learned or the message that I received from the two speakers, two different themes was I was selling myself to the devil. Again, I know that is a very harsh way to say it, but that basically one week it was like, oh my God, why am I doing this? And then the second week was more the push to take me out of it that said, you can do this, leave your job. And before I did, I will say I'm a very logical thinker. I'm a very... Um, planner with the kind of work that I always did, I would create 12, 16 month flow charts of, you know, work, work organization, who does what, when. And I created an Excel spreadsheet of the bare essentials in my life from a financial perspective of what I had to pay for. And I was literally looking at if I survive eating rice and beans every day, <laughs> how much do I need? 
And of course, it's it's so much less what we really need than what we are accustomed to spending. And that gave me the security to be able to say, I'm leaving my job. And again, I had worked uh, 40, more than 40 years as a marketing communications professional. I then decided I will continue as a marketing communications professional opening up my own business, my tagline was, my well, the name of my council was the, T-H-E, write, as if you write a letter, council, such as legal council. And the tagline was dedicated to positive transformation. And I wanted to take on clients that I felt were dedicated to positive transformation in the community. I, um, some of them were cultural nonprofits, some were health related nonprofits, but I decided I will only take on projects that to me are making a positive impact in the community, possibly because I felt for 40 years I was making a negative impact in the community. But in reality, I am, I would consider myself a yogi. And one of the branches, there are eight branches of yoga, and one of them, which is actually a chapter in my book that I've written, is all about karma yoga. And karma yoga is about doing things to help others, to help your community, to help the planet, and expecting nothing in return. Now, granted, when I opened up my business, I did charge clients but I charged them much less than what we were charging our corporate clients in the past because they were clients, again, whose values I believed in. One of them was a major um, nonprofit throughout the United States that was dedicated to social justice, equality for all. You know, how can, how can I not wanna support something like that? And one thing you did touch there, especially with karma and karma yoga, I think that's an aspect of yoga that people aren't all too familiar with. When people think yoga, they think, oh, that's stretching. That's that's a stretching class we do once a week or every now and again, maybe on a, on a summer's day. But there's a lot more to yoga than just stretching. Absolutely. And one of, I don't want to say pet peeve because I'm used to it, but one thing that I hear all the time is, oh, I can't do yoga. I'm not flexible. And what I actually tell people is from the physical perspective, if you are not flexible, it means that your body is protecting yourself from injury. Those who are very flexible are more prone to injury. If I'm in a classroom and if I see people that maybe were former dancers, I am much more concerned about the safety for them. And I will have them back off of a pose because I don't want them to, to, to cause any, any harm. But to me, I'm also a certified yoga therapist. After I left my corporate job and I decided to spend another three years to learn, 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 read, 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 research, research, research. And I became a certified yoga therapist. And very few people know what a yoga therapist is. Very people have heard of a yoga therapist. And what I tend to tell people a lot is the emphasis is on therapy, not yoga. I had one client that was in her 80s. We did not do any physical work. I worked with her on an energetic level. I have other modalities, other holistic modalities that I'm trained in. I'm trained, I'm a Reiki master. I was trained in acupressure. I was trained in um, many other things and I will tap into them as part of my yoga therapy. And I'm not saying that that's common, 
but that is what I do. So I will tap into other modalities. But my opinion of yoga is, and yoga therapy, is it's all about a lifestyle. I consider that yoga, I always tell people you can do yoga anytime, anywhere. I can do yoga right now, right here. I can do yoga in the grocery store. I can do yoga in my car. I can do yoga in bed. I can do yoga in the bathroom, in the bathtub, <laughs> because you do not need any special attire. You truly do not need a yoga mat. That's all marketing. You know, the marketing world tells you to pay a hundred dollars for a fancy mat. I am, I don't need any mat. You don't need any clothes. You can wear whatever you're wearing. And you really should be able to tap into the fundamentals of yoga anytime, anywhere. And again, the physical is just one aspect. There are three words in Sanskrit that are used to describe yoga in the ancient texts. And they're not headstands, handstands, cross-legged or, you know, or twisting. <laughs> the three words are basically to find your stillness and comfort in your seat. And what a lot of people um, say is that the physical component of yoga, the purpose of the physical yoga is not to, and again, I'm going against Western thought. People think, of course, it's to build strength, to build flexibility, to build balance. And yes, the physical component does all that. However, some people say that the true purpose of the physical component of yoga is so that you can sit still in your seat for hours and hours and meditate. Meditation is a form of yoga. That said, I also want to dispel the notion that meditation is only about sitting still in your seat. And the first chapter in my book actually is all about the many different forms of meditation you can do. And in reality, my book, which is called From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. It has 12 chapters. And in reality, I consider each chapter to be a component of yoga or yoga therapy. And yet, only one is really about the physical. The rest are other forms of yoga. And I also did want to mention most people who do yoga are familiar that the word yoga means union. Traditionally, people consider that union of body, mind, and spirit. I also consider yoga to be the union of myself with mother nature, myself with the creator or whatever source, whatever higher source you find in this world. It can also be the union of yourself with loved ones. So there, there are so many ways that you can interpret that union. It doesn't have to be just body, mind, and soul. Yeah, when it comes to that union as well, it, it's that sense of community, I think, that people are looking for, whether that's it with one person or whether it's a larger community. Um, and again, as you said, it's kind of similar to the, the the karmic yoga where it's serving others helps bring you that awareness or that peace, that stillness. I think one thing that a lot of people have difficulty with and struggle a lot with is sitting still with themselves, being left alone and silent with their thoughts. That's when they start getting agitated. That's when they start to start fidgeting. And they're like, no, I need to get up. I've got much more important things to do in my life than sit here and listen to my own thoughts. Absolutely. And I would definitely say that I fit that category. I would consider myself, I have questioned if I have or had, still have, attention deficit. 
because from the time I was a child, I had to be very busy, both physically, my body and my mind. And I am still that way. However, I can also, I have learned how to shut it off. But for those of us who find it hard, first of all, everyone finds it hard to have stillness of mind. And that's why in yoga, we talk about the monkey mind, because your mind is constantly jumping from one thought to another to another. It doesn't sit still. But we can train ourselves to find and to appreciate and to enjoy that stillness. At the same time, I do want to mention that that's exactly why in the first chapter of my book, I talk about many other forms of meditation. And one of them, for example, is japa. And I don't have my beads with me, but I'm sure you've seen a lot of people will wear beads on their wrists or around their neck. And oftentimes it's a piece of jewelry, <laughs> but the purpose of it is you count the beads like a rosary. A rosary has 54 beads. The japa or mala beads have 108. So it's double a rosary. And you repeat a mantra and with every repetition, you move the bead. And again, that is a very um, older form of meditation. I consider it very sacred. I do it every morning. I did it this morning from 4.30 to 5.30 in the morning before I got out of bed. But I also sometimes enjoy doing it as I'm walking. Sometimes I will do it as part of a walking meditation. I will do my mantra meditation with the mala beads. Uh, there are so many different kinds of meditation that you can do. And that's, um, I was just talking to somebody who had read my book and was talking about also how it was hard for her as a neurodivergent person to sit still and meditate. And I asked her, you know, what about, you know, so other forms that I find very meditative are gardening. And I'm doing a lot of gardening. I'm actually in Costa Rica right now. And I do a lot of gardening here and I find it very meditative. Coloring books to me are also very meditative. And you can do things like needlework. I've always done needlework all my life. But I do think it is important to be able to try to find comfort in your seat, <laughs> which again, the stillness, find comfort in the stillness of your seat um, whenever you can. Yeah, it sounds more like um more like a mindfulness meditation when you're like, as you said, with gardening or maybe going for a walk with the mantra that you're so focused on that one activity that it's you and that you're just present in that moment with the activity. Is that, is that the message you're getting across? Exactly. And that's actually the message that I think from a broader perspective, yoga teaches us. And that's why when I was talking about the union, it can be union with your activity. You know, again, um, it can be when I walk, for example, or right now I'm looking out the window and I'm mindful of the green leaves. I'm mindful of the sound of the river. I'm mindful of the, the little bugs that I see flying. And I try to be part of that world. And so that's again, the connection. So yes, mindfulness. Again, there are so many different ways that you can be mindful. And one of the concepts that I talk about in my book is I talk about when I was doing my yoga teacher training, one of the exercises that we had in mindfulness was just to go somewhere by ourselves and sit quietly, right? Well, I hiked up a little mountain. It was a hill, little mountain. And what I was focusing on is the strength and the solidity of the mountain. And it reminded me of my father, who I saw as a very secure, strong, grounded man. And so I tried to connect almost with my father who had passed on. And so I tried to connect with him through that mountain, 
So again, the union with me and the mountain and the union with my father. That's beautiful. I think I, I was similar. I think early on in my burnout journey, um, I discovered that most of the activities that I was doing in for my recovery were actually forms of escapism. I was doing high intensity exercise. I was going for runs and I found that it wasn't helping me process my thoughts. But once I started going for long walks, just went out in nature, went down to the local forest and just found my happy place among the trees. It was just dead silent. And it all I could hear is the rain, hear the rain on the leaves. And I could stay there for hours. And I knew it wasn't it wasn't so loud that I couldn't process my own thoughts. I was able to sit there in silence and just be like, what am I feeling right now? And why am I feeling this way? And just go down that rabbit hole and really get to know myself and be aware of myself in that moment, in that silence. Um, And I think that's where I kind of got that awareness, kind of similar to what you're saying there about being in that present moment. And there's a lot of healing and kind of self-awareness and self-discovery that people can find in those moments. But I think the discomfort is in actually spending that time with yourself. And it's so easy in today's life to be striving for productivity and striving for success and saying, oh, I have to be busy all the time. I have to stay busy and be productive and have this and that outcome in order to achieve the success I want. But all that while, just being stuck in the noise and not actually paying attention to what your body truly wants. I really liked the word that you used, escapism, because I think it is so true. And I think I can identify that when I was working 80 hours a week, of course, I felt I had to work 80 hours a week because I didn't want to lose my job. But in reality, it was probably also a form of escapism. And in my book, one of the chapters also talks about living a clean, sober lifestyle. And of course, you know, drugs and alcohol or any addiction, whether it be sexual addictions, gambling, workaholism, (laughs) any of those addictions are escapism and they are not healthy. We need to be happy with ourselves. And if I can, I did want to just read five easy tips from my chapter on mindfulness, because I think they're appropriate and they're very simple for anyone to pick up. And again, it's from my book, From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. And these are, again, from chapter one. Every one of my chapters has five easy tips. Number one, learn to enjoy breathing. Again, anybody can do this anywhere, anytime. It's free. Find pleasure in what most ignore. Our breath is our life force. Feel gratitude throughout your body with every inhalation and exhalation. How many of us really even focus on the inhalation or exhalation? And unless you're in a yoga class and they tell you, breathe in, breathe out. (laughs) And again, this is something that I try to do frequently. I also try to do this in bed at night to help me sleep. Um. It's so important when you're walking, you can do it when you're in the grocery store line, anytime when you're stuck in traffic, just focus on your breath and you will find a lot of emotional relief. Number two, apply deep acceptance. Regardless of the type of mindfulness you choose, be patient with yourself. Accept whatever arises and remember your state of being and mind are always changing. So that also talks about, you know, accepting yourself and escapism. We are not accepting ourselves. Number three, find a place to start. Incorporate simple and short mindfulness techniques whenever and wherever you can practice without judgment. Number four, be present. 
show up for what is going on inside and outside. If you begin to fret about the past or the imagined future, release those nagging concerns. It goes on, but I'm going to skip to number five. Do not force it. Accept where you are and what feels right for you. If that means you need help, then so be it. And again, I think that in our society, we have so many pressures. And that is also, to me, one of the um, stereotypes that I don't like about yoga. People think, oh, I have to be able to do the splits or I have to be able to do a headstand. No. As long as you can focus on your breath or as long as you can focus on serving others, which I mentioned is karma yoga, that then you can be a yogi. So there are so many different ways that you can be a yogi and you have to accept where you are and enjoy. That's brilliant because again, that mainstream belief of being a yogi is someone who can do the splits while doing a handstand and on top of a mountain. Whereas you can be completely present for yourself, as as you said, comfort in your are comfortable to in your own seat just by serving others. There, there's a very low barrier of entry to start a yoga practice today. The other thing too that I would like to mention is as a yoga therapist, I mentioned that I, you know, that my one client that was 80 years old where we didn't do anything physical, I have had people that I work with that are close to 100. I have had people that have no use of their of their legs. Um, one of the people in my book is a paraplegic and the teaching he shares with everyone is the power of laughter and laughter as medicine, laughter to alleviate pain, both physical and emotional. And I'm also a, a laughter yoga coach and so to me, again, laughter is so very important for everyone. And again, the idea that, you know, my book is based on a dozen of my gurus around the world. They are not necessarily what you may stereotypically think of as a yogi, but to me, they are all yogis. So again, one is a paraplegic wheelchair bound. And to me, he is an inspirational yogi. That's beautiful. Again, people think you're wondering what re reasons people have for holding themselves back from getting started and the excuses they come up with. And it's when you get an enlightening or inspiring story like that, you're like, okay, what, what is the real reason I haven't started? Right. And again, finding in terms of what that start is, what is appropriate for you. And that's why my book, the concept of my book is, you know, the 12 gurus and 12 different focus areas. And I encourage people to, I have a tracker, a 40 day tracker that people can download when they read the book. And you can pick one of the subjects. So let's just say mindfulness. So maybe tomorrow you decide, okay, I am going to try to be mindful every day for the next 40 days. So you have that tracker. And then maybe maybe 40 days later, maybe three months later, you decide, you know, I want to try some karma yoga, some selfless service. I want to be mindful of selfless service every day. And it can be done every day. Maybe it's helping an elderly neighbor. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can have um, selfless service. And so maybe then for the next 40 days, you focus on karma yoga. And then maybe 40 days later, you decide, I'm going to try to laugh every day. <laughs> no matter what happens, I'm just going to laugh. And so again, my concept also is that I'm not expecting people to pick up 12 different habits from one day to the next but when it's most right for them. It's going to take a minute of your time going to be short and snappy. If you're a longtime listener, or maybe this is your first episode, I have a small favor to ask. 
And the only way that we're going to break the stigma around mental health in the workplace is by having these open conversations, talking about these topics. And what better way than to have those discussions with your loved ones, with your family, your friends, your co-workers. So if you could like, follow or subscribe on whatever platform or app you're listening to this and share this episode with a loved one or someone that you think could gain value from hearing this, it would mean so much. Thank you. Let's get back to the episode. Something as simple as laughing or as I like to say, something as simple as starting off every day with a smile. Just be it to your partner, be it to your dog, be it to your own reflection in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth. Start off every day with a smile. And then the next level up from that is to smile at the first person you see, be that in your work day or as soon as you leave go outside your front door, because that's going to have a ripple effect. And um, other small things you do mention as well, uh, other than laughing, singing is a, a great um, hormone, a feel good hormone release. Right. Well, I want to mention that actually talking about hormone release, I want to talk about um, singing, smiling and laughing. They all three are wonderful, feel good hormone releasers. And in fact, there is a very large percentage of people in the world that have chronic pain. And in fact, chronic low back, I'm sorry, chronic back pain is the number one cause for people in the United States to visit a doctor. And it's also the number one cause for people missing work or having to leave work. And because chronic pain, and I actually had chronic pain, low back pain from the time I was very young. Of course, I I manage it all with everything I talk about in my book, but, but because chronic pain is something near and dear to me, I also suffered from chronic um, um, stomach pain from the time I was also very young. And so because of that, on September 2nd and 3rd, I am going to be offering my book From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram the ebook on Amazon for free. And it's because I really want people to learn techniques to ease pain. And actually the entire reason, one of the main reasons why I wrote my book was again, because I had chronic pain both in the back and in the stomach from the time I was young. And now I'm fine. I don't have any pain, but <laughs> every day I have to keep on track so that I don't have recurring pain. And that's why in actuality, my book is all about easing physical and emotional pain. So going back now to the question you asked, and again, I love it because you asked about singing and I love singing. And I even lead workshops called Chant and Be Happy. And I have a, um, I have an in-person and a virtual Chant and Be Happy workshop coming up. And it, it's just incredible what singing does in terms of the hormones. And what's very interesting is when you sing in unison with other people, it also affects your heart rate variability. And it's almost like if you practice mindfulness or meditation, if you're in a corner doing your meditation on your own, wonderful. But if you do it in a group, the power is magnified and I have felt it. I felt it once just with one other person. I happened to be meditating just with one other person, but the energy that I felt from her was incredible. The same thing when you sing, you can sing in the bathtub or in the shower. It's wonderful. But if you sing in unison, it's even greater. And that's why when I do my chant and be happy workshops, I'm encouraging people to chant or sing, not only whenever they want by themselves, but also when I lead yoga classes, I love it when people sing during the class. And sometimes they may be, let's just say a Sanskrit mantra, but sometimes I'll do a Beatles playlist and I'll have everybody, you know, sing out, um, I'm just going to make this up because this isn't one on my playlist, but 
you know, I want to hold your hand, you know, so again, that's not on my playlist, but here comes the sun is on my playlist. I have an entire 90 minute Beatles playlist and we all, most of us all know the lyrics to all the Beatles songs. When you are doing yoga, why not sing it? It just enhances the entire experience. And if I can just read a little bit, um, I wanted to mention that every chapter in my book, aside from the five easy tips, every chapter also rationalizes with scientific research why things are good for us because I'm the kind of person I'm like, oh yeah, prove it. <laughs> you know, if somebody says something, I want to know. Well, for sure. I'm just going to read something. This is actually an excerpt from another book that I highly recommend, which is called The Mozart Effect by Don Campbell. And he talks in particular in his book about the effect of Mozart music on humans. And of course, it's wonderful, but it doesn't have to be Mozart. Actually, any genre helps. But this is just a beautiful quote from his book. In an instant, music can uplift our soul. Music can dance and sing our blues away. The human voice is a remarkable instrument of healing, our most accessible sonic tool. The slightest utterance massages muscle tissue in the upper body and causes it to vibrate from within. And then I talk about research and how researchers confirm that singers have lower cortisol levels. That's the stress hormone. Chanting or singing, like breath work, activates the parasympathetic system, thereby lowering blood pressure and producing a zen-like state. And one of the things that I just did maybe three days ago in one of my yoga classes is as they were in a downward dog, I had them all repeat, ah, uh, so they just kept repeating it. And then in their next downward dog, I had them repeat, a, and then, oh, and then, ooh, I missed the I. <laughs> Maybe because I is egotistical. <laughs> but the point is, you don't have to know the lyrics to sing. Um, another thing that I do when I lead yoga, I'm sorry, when I lead laughter yoga, I oftentimes will include humming exercises in the very end because humming is also extremely therapeutic. But in my laughter yoga sessions, I almost always have people sing and dance and of course smile and of course laugh because it's called laughter yoga. One of my laughter yoga themes is Mary Poppins. And we sing and dance, we take an imaginary broom and we're the chimney sweepers. And so we dance around as if we have that broom and we're sweeping that rooftop. And then we sing supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Is that from the, that? Is that from that? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we sing nonsense words because when we sing sometimes lyrics, sometimes we focus on the meaning and we don't want to. We just want to have fun. And so a song such as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious or chimp chimney, those are great ways to unwind and for all the feel good hormones to kick in. Another um, one of my laughter yoga components is, or themes is from the Tex-Mex um, queen, Selena, who passed away. She was murdered when she was very young. And I call that um, session, Bitty Bitty Bum Bum, which are the lyrics to one of her songs. They mean absolutely nothing. And so it's just about, you know, having fun with the sounds, which is what little children always do, you know? So I'm going to just say, bitty, bitty, bum, bum, bitty, bitty, bum, bum, bitty, bitty, bum, bum. And now I want you to do that. Bitty, bitty, bum, bum, bitty, bitty, bum, bum, bitty, bitty, bum, bum. It's almost like a tongue twister in itself. It is. It is. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think that's something that people forget to do is to like 
all this happiness and singing that we do as a child. We don't care if anyone's listening. We dance as if no one's watching. And as a child, you're more present in the moment than ever in your life. And you're probably at your happiest stage as well. And we forget that as we get older or we're told not to do that. That's not that's not a very mature thing for an adult to do. You shouldn't be dancing around the kitchen. You shouldn't be singing as you walk down the street because more than likely people are going to think that you're crazy. Whereas these are the releases of endorphins of all these and serotonin, these happy hormones that we all need. But we're supposed to do it behind closed doors. We're not meant to do it in unity. And I think this is where people get this endorphin release when they go to nightclubs or they go to concerts. And this is the only place where they find themselves having the confidence to sing as part of a community or to dance as part of a community, I find. it's, it's, It's kind of a lower barrier of entry. Whereas I think... Uh, when you have classes or or uh, retreats or um, lessons um, to people become more confident in themselves. But I think the lowest barrier of entry for people who are looking for that release of endorphins is to go to a concert or to go to a club. The other thing that I want to mention, which bothers me, is that sometimes people think they need to drink alcohol or take other drugs before they feel comfortable dancing or whatever, because yes, drugs and alcohol are, they do minimize your inhibitions, but we should be able to do that ourselves. We should be able to turn that switch on and off ourselves. We shouldn't have to rely on other substances to release our inhibitions. Yes. And I feel that that's where dependencies and likes come as well, where people know that, well, they think that it's the alcohol or it's whatever they're taking is giving them that endorphin release. Whereas it's, if anything, it's, again, it's just um, blocking the inhibition. Um, and they think that all that endorphin release can only come from substance use. Whereas if they could just get past that initial barrier or that initial obstacle and be like, I'm just going to dance like a fool. I don't care who's watching. I'm going to sing in the street. Uh, even for me, um, not, not not to do with substance use at all, but I was yesterday, I went for a walk down by the river and it, I was just getting some fresh air, enjoying it was a nice, peaceful day. And I passed a guy. Um, this is very relevant to your story about singing. Uh, and he was just playing the Beatles on the guitar, just playing Ticket to Ride as he was um, sitting on the riverside. And I was just past him. And next thing I was like, no, I'm going back. I'm, I'm going back and I'm sitting down with him because this is such a beautiful moment. And it turned into we spent the next hour just talking and passing the, the guitar back and forth and just playing different songs and sharing different songs. He was sharing things like um, Elizabeth Cotton and things that I had never heard of. And he was like, look, these are songs from my era. You probably have never heard of them. So I'm going to share some of these songs. And then I started sharing some of the more modern songs that I would have learned back in my school days. And he was like, OK, they're very interesting. And it was just one of those beautiful, wholesome moments where we shared our songs and our experience together. Nothing to do with no no beer, no substances. It was just a pure wholesome moment. I love that. But I wonder how many people would have ever stopped. How many other say- people just walked on by? Right. That is so beautiful. I will mention um, this was a slightly different scenario where I felt more invited to join, but I was uh, recently at the International Association of Yoga Therapists Convention um, near Washington, DC. And after all of the activities ended one night, you know, everybody goes back to their own rooms and does whatever. And I heard music coming from somewhere where I could tell it was live music. And in a hallway, in a corner of a hallway, there was a woman and I don't even remember. I think she, I don't know if she had a harmonium. I don't even remember what instrument she had, but she was doing mantras. And so I joined her and then more people joined. 
And of course, we're all, of course, connected because we're all part of the Yoga Therapists Association. So we feel more comfortable joining as opposed to an unknown. Not that I knew her, but I knew that we had that connection. And then the next night, and it was beautiful. And then the next night, as I was going to bed also, you know, I'm in that by the elevators and I heard a different kind of music and I went and I followed it. And it was actually um, one of the men from our group. And again, I don't know if there were, let's just say there were 500 of us. I don't know. It, he had actually invited a friend of his who was not part of the group, but who played guitar or banjo or I don't know what. And they were doing a very different genre, more um, bluegrass. And little by little, more and more people came. And at one point, you know, the president of our organization came and he was taking photos and it was just beautiful. And everybody was so joyous. And some of us were standing up and moving to the music. And uh, he did play a few Beatles tunes as well. There's something magical about the Beatles. Uh, I, I saw I saw um, Paul McCartney a few years back and it was like it was just something I I knew in the back of my mind, I was like, I cannot pass down this opportunity just to see one of the Beatles. And it's just something that even in the simplicity of their songs, it's like, no, there's something magical here that when someone starts singing the Beatles or someone starts playing the Beatles, everyone wants to join in. Or I've been to concerts before and our festivals and you'd be moving from one stage to the other and you're just in this massive crowd of people all just, it's kind of like, going with the current, just being pushed with the mob to towards the next um, um, stage. And someone would just start singing Hey Jude and everyone joins in the chorus. They all start singing Hey Jude together. It's, it's just so the simplicity of it. And again, it's just kind of like a chant. Everyone just joins in and everyone then is lifted and moving from one uh, one place to the next to the time passes so much faster and you're more, you feel more safe and secure as well rather than feeling kind of claustrophobic, moving with this massive crowd of thousands of people, you're like, no, everyone is joining in. I feel a bit more comfortable. This feels like a community. Well, the other thing that I find so beautiful about the Beatles and about a few other artists is that people of all generations love them and from all countries. And if you also think about Again, I'm not a musician. I don't know anything about composition, but you were talking about the simplicity of their music. And traditionally, sacred music, mantra music is simple. And one of the research studies that I cite in my book talked about Ave Maria. So again, that you know goes back for a very long time. And then it also talked about, it compared Ave Maria to Om Mani Padme Om, which is another Sanskrit uh, mantra. And both of them had very high positive results compared to, and I'm just gonna make this up. I, I don't remember what the third one was. The third one was not a sacred tune and it still was beneficial. But the Ave Maria and the Om Mani Padme Hum had greater results. And that's why I always say in my chant and be happy workshops, it doesn't matter what language you chant in or what genre, everything is beneficial. And I was talking about Don Campbell's book, The Mozart Effect. And he talks about how even rap music or even I don't know if he says heavy metal, but hard rock music, they all are beneficial to our health and well-being. I can attest to heavy metal being very beneficial to my well-being. And it, it's especially growing up, I was like, no, this this is something that resonates with my soul and my emotions. And in, in terms of just processing that emotion, people are like, oh, it's scary. Oh, it's an angry music. I'm like, no, it's very meaningful if you listen to the lyrics and it's it's literally it's someone portraying their emotions most of the time it's like you know what they're being aware of those emotions and portraying them and they need to be felt and there's a sense of community in uh in 
acknowledging those emotions as well in music. Um, so yes, I can definitely attest for heavy metal, especially. I, I won't get into it, but there's there's some like there's some kind of a resonance there in 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 some beats that where you're like, okay, that that definitely resonates with me on a on a deeper level. Uh, and and you could hear it from miles away, and it's like, okay, there there's a beat there that definitely just resonates with me. Maybe it's something that it doesn't matter what kind of music it is or what genre it is. It's just something that you're familiar with or that you're comfortable with. Um, and, well, and, you mentioned, and you mentioned beats. Yes. Um, the beat is so important because around the world, throughout history, man made music through beats, whether it was sticks, whether it was gourds, whether it was leather, you know, pulled on to make drums. There had always has been the beat and the beat also symbolizes your mother's heartbeat when you are in the womb. And so again, you know, whether it's a boom, 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 or a much more uh, different style, but those beats are so important. Brilliant, Deborah. If anyone is interested in finding out more about your book and um and about you yourself, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Well, first of all, I do have a YouTube channel. And on my YouTube channel, I talk a lot about what yoga therapy is. And you can also, of course, see about my book as well. But my YouTube channel and my Instagram are both my name, Deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, and Charns, C-H-A-R-N-E-S. And my book website and my therapy website are debracharns.com. And for the book, it's slash book. And again, if um, for a visual, I don't know if you can see, but that's my name spelled out, Deborah Charns, and this is my book. And again, I do want to encourage um, if people can share the word with whomever has physical or emotional pain to please take advantage of my free download on September 2nd and 3rd on Amazon for the, for the ebook. Those are going to be the only days. And normally it's $7 and 99 cents in the U S and equivalent prices around the world. And, um, you know, you can, you can get my book pretty much anywhere, but the free book will be Amazon only. That's great. So Amazon 2nd and 3rd of September, you can pick up your book for free. And that's, again, you serving the community on a, right. on a global of level through Amazon. Of course, I'd love everybody to pay the full price for the softback, for the for the paperback. But at the same time, um, you know, I want as many people as possible to do the free download. Awesome. Brilliant. Deborah, it was great having you here on Give Yourself Some Leeway. And thank you again for your time during the show. Thank you so much. And my best to everyone listening, tuning in.